from KAMR Local 4 News, your local election headquarters. This is Politics Today with Jackie Kingston. All of the Democratic presidential candidates who qualified for this debate could fit on one stage. That was nice this week. We'll show you some highlights from the third debate in Houston and how the two candidates from Texas responded to concerns from voters. And lawmakers back in Washington with the goal of doing something about gun violence in our country. See what the legislation, what legislation they're considering to help stop mass shootings. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. Did you tune into the debate on Thursday night? A lot of people did, and despite what pundits are calling gaffes from the candidates, the 10 candidates at the third Democratic presidential debate covered issues of high importance for Texas voters. Politics Today's Steffi Lee was there on Thursday night and shows us the priorities highlighted by the two Texas candidates. Both Beto O'Rourke and Julian Castro seized the opportunity to make the case on immigration, the racial divide, and gun control. These issues are personal for both Texans, especially recently with the mass shootings here in the Lone Star State. Hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15, your AK-47. We're not going to allow it to be used against our fellow Americans anymore. One of the boldest statements of the evening from former Congressman Beto O'Rourke on gun buybacks. Those surviving family members who lost somebody who are asking me and anybody who will listen, why have we not taken action so far and why do we still allow this to happen in our country? At one point, former Housing and Urban Development Secretary Julian Castro attacked former Vice President Joe Biden on how the Barack Obama administration handled immigration issues. And every time somebody questions part of the administration that we were both part of, he says, well, that was the president. I mean, he wants to take credit for Obama's work, but not have to answer to any questions. With Texas as ground zero for this topic, Castro says it's not only about changing the rhetoric. You know, it's going to take a, a president that actually treats people with respect instead of cruelty. Healthcare consumed a significant portion of this debate and also highlighted how different each candidate approaches this issue. Some support Medicare for all, but also disagree on immediate and future costs tied to that proposal. In Houston, Steffi Lee, back to you. Steffi, thank you. That the latest, rather, University of Texas, Texas Tribune poll shows the former vice president in first place ahead of Senator Elizabeth Warren and Beto O'Rourke in the Lone Star State. Julian Castro tied for seventh. Those results were published before the debate took place on Thursday night. Back here to local politics now. Council, city council members in the city of Amarillo are looking to raise the tax rate for Amarillo taxpayers. Last week was the last public hearing over the proposal. The proposed tax rate would increase by about $168 a month for a $100,000 home. That amounts to just more than $20 a year. That money will be used for new positions for the fire department and Amarillo Animal Management and Welfare. They're also using some of that money for street repairs. The first reading and vote for the tax rate is coming up this week on Tuesday. The final vote happening on September 24th. The city also made some changes to match a new bill signed by Governor Greg Abbott last week. They revised their public and environmental health ordinance to match Senate Bill 476. That bill makes it legal for you to bring your pet with you while you eat dinner on a restaurant's patio. Dogs do have to be leashed, well-mannered. They have to go through the patio entrance, but of course they are not allowed inside the establishment itself at any time. The city of Canyon has narrowed its search for a city manager to four candidates. Among those candidates are Chris Sharp, who is the current finance director for the city of Canyon, John Behrens, who is currently serving as the interim city manager, Joseph Price, who currently serves as the assistant city manager and director of planning and development for the city of Borger, also, Jacob Ellis, who serves as the deputy town manager for the town of Gilbert, Arizona. His photo was not provided to us. A former Shamrock mayor has been arrested. Texas DPS tells us Aaron Shannon was arrested for aggravated assault on a peace officer back in August. They say the FBI and the Texas Rangers are now investigating that situation. And not directly political, but a donor so major he certainly had political pull in our area and across the nation. Oil tycoon T. Boone Pickens died last week at the age of 91. A spokesman said Pickens died in his, at his hospice home on Wednesday. Pickens suffered a series of strokes in 2017 and was hospitalized that July. Pickens founded what would become Mesa Petroleum and went on to create BP Capital, an energy-focused investment firm. Over his career, Pickens gave more than a billion dollars to charities. Former Amarillo Mayor Jerry Hodge was a friend and later a business competitor of Pickens. The two had a bit of a falling out in 1989, call it that, when Pickens and Amarillo lacked, said that Amarillo lacked leadership. 
and predicted that the population of our town would drop. Ahad says he was invited out to Pickens Ranch recently, where the two put those issues in the past. Boone Pickens was, he was one hell of a competitor. Even though we battled, had a lot of respect for him, he was a smart guy. But we both kind of buried the hatchet the last two or three weeks. Pickens was at one time the chairman for the Board of Regents at West Texas State University, where he helped to restore Old Main, now known as West Texas A&M University. Plans for a memorial ceremony at Highland Park Methodist Church down in Dallas are pending. Last week, House members discussed a series of gun control measures. It's the first step toward action taken on Capitol Hill since this summer's mass shootings. Politics Today Washington correspondent Bree Jackson has details. With Congress back from summer session, Democrats say their first order of business is to help protect lives. We will make sure the issue of gun safety remains front and center. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer is calling for a vote on bills including H.R. 8, which would expand background checks. The House already approved the measure, but it stalled in the Senate. Congresswoman Veronica Escobar says supporters aren't giving up. Just because one chamber chooses not to govern, doesn't mean that we are going to acquiesce. Another bipartisan bill up for consideration would expand background checks to all commercial sales. But some lawmakers say passing more laws focused on background checks won't keep guns out of the wrong hands. So are you suggesting we ought to pass a law just to pretend like we're doing something, but would actually not have a positive impact on saving lives. Texas Senator John Cornyn says new laws alone won't prevent crime. He says he supports further discussions on legislative solutions. What can and what should we do to try to stop incidents like these in the future? But Virginia Senator Mark Warner urges lawmakers to take action. 93% of Americans agree that we ought to put in place universal background checks. In Washington, Bree Jackson. Lawmakers are looking at more than just background checks. They say they're weighing red flag laws as another option to keep guns away from dangerous people. Safety measures happening in the world of education, too. Bringing mental health and trauma to the forefront this week in Oklahoma is the state superintendent of public instruction, Joy Hoffmeister. Hoffmeister testified before the U.S. House Education and Labor Committee's subcommittee on early childhood, elementary, and secondary education. The hearing was entitled, The Importance of Trauma-Informed Practices in Education to Assist Students Impacted by Gun Violence and Other Adversities. Hoffmeister spoke to the subcommittee about how Oklahoma is supporting students with trauma. When our kids have that strong, strengthened relationship with their teachers, they are going to be able to be more engaged and also have that one caring adult that we know is paramount for moving beyond trauma to hope and a brighter future. A question on many people's minds this week, if they were paying attention at all to what was happening in Washington, is, is the president, is he being impeached? Frankly, I'm not sure anyone on either side of the aisle, even anyone in the White House truly knows, but we know what we know now that we know what we don't know. And we'll share that with you when we come back. I'm Jackie Kingston. You're watching Politics Today from your local election headquarters. It is not every week that we dip our toe in the so-called swamp of Washington, but some weeks require more attention to what's going on there than others, starting here. The U.S. Supreme Court gave the Trump administration permission last week to enforce its toughest restrictions yet on asylum seekers at our southern border. The justice's late order means that migrants coming from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador cannot seek asylum if they don't first do so in Mexico. It would also apply to many other asylum seekers who come to the U.S. southern border from other countries. Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sonia Sotomayor dissented saying the court acted too quickly and should allow the case to work its way through the normal judicial process. President Trump announced on Twitter last week he has fired National Security Advisor John Bolton, his fourth, depends on who's counting, a tweet saying, quote, I informed Bolt John Bolton last night that his services are no longer needed at the White House. I disagreed strongly with many of his suggestions, as did others in the administration, and therefore I asked John for his resignation, which was given to me this morning. The tweets came just about an hour before Bolton was to be a part 
part of a White House briefing with the Secretaries of State and Treasury. Bolton was Trump's third national security advisor, replacing Army General H.R. McMaster. There was one in there who was never official, just interim. About 10 minutes after President Trump tweeted about firing Bolton, Bolton contradicted the president in his own tweet, saying, I offered to resign last night, and the president said, let's talk about it tomorrow. Lawmakers are taking a step toward impeachment proceedings against President Trump. The House Judiciary Committee voted on Thursday on the ground rules for an investigation, including potential hearings. Earlier this summer, the committee argued in court a full House vote was not needed to start a formal impeachment inquiry. Later this month, three Trump campaign and administration officials are scheduled to testify in front of that committee. There are some mixed messages, though. While some committee members are calling their work in actual impeachment hearing or investigation, others are reframing it. They're refraining from labeling it that way, at least. The Judiciary Committee is expected to expand the scope of its investigation this fall to include whether foreign payments to the president and his businesses violated the Constitution. President Trump's former personal attorney has been reportedly talking to investigators about the hush money payments made to Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal. New York state prosecutors met with Michael Cohen in jail in recent weeks, according to people familiar with that matter. Cohen is serving a three-year sentence right now. His crimes include paying $130,000 to Stormy Daniels about her to keep her silent about her alleged affair with the president. Investigators are now looking into whether the Trump organization violated state laws by falsifying its reimbursement to Cohen. Cohen is one of several people who may know details about those payments, but he could also have a credibility problem after lying to lawmakers about his plans about plans to build a Trump Tower in Moscow. President Trump has denied having affairs with those two women. It was a more than 20,000 mile trek for farmers for free trade as they arrived in our nation's capital this week. Coming up, why they're pushing for a vote on the USMCA trade deal and why they say they need that vote soon. Farmers from around the country gathered on the National Mall to call on Congress to vote now on the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade deal. Three countries have been negotiating, those three in fact, but they still need final approval from lawmakers. Politics Today Washington correspondent Jesse Tenor reports the crowd says they need trade agreements, not tariffs, to succeed. We will get this agreement done. With the U.S. Capitol towering in the background, Democrats and Republicans promised some of the biggest names in farming that they will approve a deal between the U.S. and its two biggest trade partners before the end of the year. Canada wants this. Mexico wants this. Our farmers want this. Our business and industries want this. So let's get this done. The agreement to replace NAFTA, called USMCA, is one of President Trump's biggest priorities ahead of the 2020 election. But Democrats who control the House still have concerns about how it will affect labor rules, drug costs, and environmental protections. The Trump administration gave them a counter offer Wednesday. While Democrats wade through the specifics, one of them says it's better than the alternative. To have no agreement, and I think that would be disastrous to our economy as well as to our neighbors of the South and to the North. Farmers caution Congress their time is running out. It's kind of been a perfect storm for a lot of Midwesterners between some of the weather challenges that we have faced um, on top of the trade deal challenges that we're facing. Farmers for Free Trade traveled 20,000 miles across the country to encourage the agriculture industry to support the deal. My dad said that it's a blessing to live in this wonderful democratic republic that we live in, but what makes it work is when people that are governed participate in it. In Washington, I'm Jesse Tenor. Now lawmakers and lobbyists will just wait to see if their work was enough to bring the USMCA to a floor vote in the House. The Environmental Protection Agency is doing away with clean water regulations. It's called Waters of the United States. You probably know it as WOTUS. It was put in place by the Obama administration in 2015. It lays out what bodies of water are protected under the Federal Clean Water Act, including streams and wetlands, uh, playa lakes also included in that. The next step is to replace that regulation. President, the president of the Texas Southwestern Cattle Raisers Association, Robert McKnight Jr., had this to say on the day of the ruling, quote, today's final repeal of the 2015 WOTUS rule by the EPA and Army Corps is a tremendous victory for cattle raisers. After years of court battles and an unpredictable patchwork of regulations, it's about time that we put this behind us and get back to the business of raving, raising the beef our nation needs. The state with one of the highest populations tops the charts when it comes to uninsured people. Coming up, 
What that could mean for the Lone Star State ahead of the decennial census. For the second year in a row, Texas's uninsured rate went up. The Lone Star State, again, leads the country in having the highest number of people without health care coverage. As Politics Today's Steffi Lee shows us, experts hope that these numbers draw attention to both policies and the 2020 census. We're not just a little bit worse. We are over twice the national average in terms of uninsured. Numbers from the U.S. Census Bureau show more than 5 million Texans don't have health insurance. With 5 million people involved, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution, but there are things that our state can do and things that the feds need to do. That's why the 2020 Census is so important. It determines funding from certain federal programs, including Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, and SNAP, or food benefits. There's a saying that for health, you can pay now or you can pay later. And so one of the things to prevent a lot of chronic disease and other things is to eat healthy. Some of those working on outreach for the census worry the fear factor among immigrant families that affects health care coverage will also result in an inaccurate count. Where families are dropping coverage for U.S. citizen children in health care and in hunger programs as well. The same chilling effect could also drive down the willingness of our mixed immigration families to participate in the census. So the state demographer reminds us. If we don't get that right, if we do have an undercount, that's going to have implications for the rest of the decade. The U.S. Census Bureau statistics also show that the number of people nationwide without health insurance also went up for the first time since 2008 since the 2008 to 2009 period. Experts say changes in these rates show economic trends, demographic shifts, and policy changes both at the state and at the federal level as well. Speaking of needing insurance, President Trump announces his administration is working on new rules to stop the sale of flavored vaping products. Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar tells Jesse Tenor that they could be in place after a few weeks. She joins us now again with more. People are dying with vaping. So we're looking at it very closely. The Trump administration is taking on the e-cigarette industry after the outbreak of vaping related illness resulting in at least six deaths. The president, alongside Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar, announced he plans to ban flavored e-cigarette products. The Obama administration had allowed them to be on the market, uh, even though they technically under law have to come in and get FDA approval. Azar says in about two months, companies will have to remove flavored vaping products from store shelves. To get back in front of customers, they will have to apply for FDA approval. It has to be in the public health interest for us to approve it to be on the market. Getting approval may be difficult because Azar says vaping among teenagers is already at an all-time high. We're not going to let this generation become the one that flips us back to growing utilization of cigarettes. E-cigarette companies agree they should only be used by adults. But in a statement, the American Vaping Association said destroying thousands of small businesses and sending ex-smokers back to smoking will do nothing to stop drug dealers from selling contaminated THC cartridges. Secretary Azar acknowledged companies may try to block the rules with a lawsuit. If they do, they do. But what's important is we're here protecting the public health based on science evidence and acting completely in conformity with the law. In Washington, I'm Jesse Tenor. Texas is not immune. In fact, this month, health officials in Houston warned against vaping after three young people were hospitalized with serious lung issues. It is scared of everything taller than about two feet. It needs perfect conditions to lay eggs, and its mating call is, it's literally a boom. The population of the lesser prairie chicken is declining rapidly, but we may not quite be ready to close the book on the species. Coming up, a big win for a very small bird in this app. As we all continue to feel the effects of climate change on our planet, increasing temperatures due to global warming aren't only affecting us, they're hurting our wildlife too, and not far away, here in fact, where a tiny bird called the lesser prairie chicken makes its home. That guy, there. But we may yet be able to save these lesser lovable fowl, so this happened this week. The lesser prairie chicken has been up for consideration for the endangered species list, but that decision overturned in 2014. This week, conservation groups learned that the LPC 
will get at least a decision as to whether it will be protected under the Endangered Species Act by May of 2021. It's previously been classified as threatened, but if it's threatened, it's also protected. And as you can imagine, energy groups that want to develop the grassland where LPC calls its home felt like that was well giving them the bird. So they took it to the courts, they sided with them. Populations of prairie chickens have plummeted since 2012. They, they puff up their little cheeks, boom their mating call. They're really cute. I just want to save the lesser prairie chicken. Don't forget that you can follow along with us on Facebook throughout the week. You can find me there along with KAMR Local 4. Follow us on Twitter. I'm Jackie Kingston plus the number one and stay up with everything politically minded on our website myhighplains.com where we have continuing coverage of the upcoming election season. Hey, good time to check and make sure you register to vote. We'll see you next week.